This is a recording of a presentation that was made to the Lymphology Summer Days in Volksy on June um, 24th, 2023. I took my Dr. Vodder training in 1997 on the lovely Vancouver Island with Hildegard Whitlinger and Robert Harris. During one of the theory lectures, we were shown images like these of people affected by filariasis related lymphedema, which I'd never heard of before. As I sat in the back of the classroom, literally crying and wondering how this terrible thing could happen to anyone, I also knew that I'd found my calling and that I could die happy if I'd been able to do something to help someone like this. Fast forward a decade or so, and I had the opportunity to travel with Professor Neil Pillar and a team from Flinders Medical Centre to India as part of an invited team providing training to allied health professionals at the Christian Medical Centre in Tamil Nadu. From here, we visited an outreach centre where I had my first lesson on how hard my dream was going to be to achieve. There was very little interest in helping people with lymphedema as they weren't going to die and the health workers were busy with more important programs, like screening for cervical cancer, which was a really big killer of women in the region at that time. Undeterred, I conducted my PhD research on lymphatic filariasis in Myanmar, with a study on children and young adults who were infected with the worms but had no sign of overt lymphedema. We were able to demonstrate that they had clinically relevant and statistically significant tissue changes compared to their uninfected peers. And that was actually a, quite an important finding in the uh, LF space. I was then very fortunate to work with the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine in the Centre for Neglected Tropical Diseases as principal investigator on a large multi-centre randomised controlled trial in Bangladesh and Ethiopia. The results of this study have led to our current work, so I'll give you just a bit of a background on that. For those of you who are not familiar with the global program to eliminate lymphatic filariasis, this is a WHO-led initiative that includes all 72 LF endemic countries. And there are two main aims. First of all, stop transmission. LF is a mosquito-borne disease with microfilaria being carried between the human host, where the adult worms make nests in the lymph vessels and prevent lymphatic pumping. There's a mass drug administration program which endemic countries undertake every year for multiple years with the aim to stop transmission of these microfilaria. And therefore, there should be no new cases. The twin pillar, as they are known, is morbidity management and disability prevention, which requires endemic countries to provide education and support for everyone with existing disease in a model known as community-based home care. But despite the twin status of these programs, countries receive much less funding and support for the morbidity management and disability prevention part of the program. In fact, it was originally known as a minimum package of care, and I'm pleased to say we've been able to influence a change to at least an essential package of care, but the actual program still hasn't changed much yet and only offers uh, only minimal support. It's heavily focused on the core aspects of hygiene to reduce secondary infections known as acute attacks and to provide advice on what to do when they do have an acute infection. These are critically important in reducing the disability, pain and social exclusion that is very strongly associated with filariasis. There are some rudimentary leg exercises in the program, but nothing that we would recognise as really specifically supporting or stimulating lymph flow. When you look at the data from numerous studies on the results of this basic program, it's clear that it does reduce the frequency and severity of the acute attacks. And there may be some advantages for people who have mild disease in terms of the size of their swelling, 
but it makes little or no difference for people who already have moderate and severe disease. So our remit for the study conducted at CNTD was to try to improve the lymphedema self-care activities for those more advanced cases. And uh, in the RCT that we conducted on, on people um, who were already in the existing program, we, we called that training standard care. And then we compared that to a protocol which had additional activities such as deep breathing and more effective leg exercises. And we taught them simple skin mobilisation and lymphatic massage. We called our program an enhanced lymphedema self-care protocol. We didn't take anything out of the current program and we weren't aiming to replace it. Our goal was to add home-based activities that would significantly improve patient outcomes without adding any burden to either the family or the local health services. The results are all published open access and the main findings were that compared to the Ministry of Health program, the standard care program, the enhanced lymphedema care group had small but clinically relevant changes in limb circumference and tissue stiffness. So they're the green bars that you see on the graph. And there was also a reduction in the number of acute episodes and those episodes were of shorter duration. So correspondingly, the people had significantly less days away from work or from family duties because of their lymphedema. And again, you can see the green bars are the intervention group um, and they have a better outcome than the um, standard group. Everybody does well, just the enhanced care, they do a bit. Based on these results, CNTD secured further funding to take the training to Malawi Timor-Leste and Nepal to assist the program managers there to integrate um, the enhanced care protocol into their <coughs> national LF program. COVID prevented me from going, so I developed some videos for our trainers and Fikre from Ethiopia and Saeed from Bangladesh were able to take the training to Malawi and Nepal respectively. So they had experienced trainers to, to help them, but we couldn't get anyone into Timor-Leste so I had to give them 100% online materials. That was a big learning curve for everyone and the resulting online course is now available for free to any Ministry of Health or NGO working in tropical lymphedema and you can find that at Moving Lymph Online. The pandemic also allowed me to reimagine my dream of creating a foundation that would send therapists into affected communities to deliver more comprehensive lymphedema services. I realised that digital channels were going to be much more effective for a fraction of the cost. And in 2021, together with one of my original academic supervisors, Dr Patricia Graves, we established the LKN Foundation to continue developing the digital training tools. Our mission is to create evidence-based virtual training tools on lymphedema self-care, to create an open access platform for social sharing and integration with existing mHealth systems, and to connect experienced therapists with neglected populations via a virtual mentoring network. But it's one thing to have such aspirations and another to make them happen. <clears throat> and although Tricia and I had a lot of knowledge between us, 
what we don't have is much money. So this is where our namesake, our namesake Kingsley, uh, comes into the picture because he funded a lot of the background costs for my um, research in Myanmar, and he's covered all of the legal fees for setting up the foundation. But his resources are not endless, and so we've spent the first year grant writing and not receiving any grants, <clears throat> and then out of the blue an anonymous donation for $100,000. And that has allowed us to start making the first massage videos. These early drafts still look a little clunky, but it's quite a complicated process, which involves making these digital skeletons of each character and creating their movements. And then the skeletons can be dressed for each culture, each skin type, facial features, even creating very regional ones as we did for these, uh, this one for our workshop in uh, Sankura in Ethiopia. which is where our Ethiopia partners at the Mazil Integrated Development Organisation conducted our first workshops on these videos. Sankura is about six hours south of Addis Ababa and it's endemic for both filariasis and podoconiosis. People affected by lymphedema, their family members and the community caregivers were all invited to the health post for the workshops. We conducted workshops in two villages with 10 patients uh, in each village with uh, an adult caregiver and the local health extension workers. There were slightly more women affected by lymphedema than men, but the caregivers were primarily women and most were the daughter of the patient. But there was one woman who brought her 20 year old son along to learn how to care for her. At follow-up, at follow many of the patients brought a different caregiver, which was really great as the more people who are exposed to the self-care information, the more support there will be within the family and in the broader community. We also needed to know if people were going to be able to relate to and use our digital tools without any formal training. So we asked them what they think was their purpose. And I like this one, the leg giving the patient giving his leg for the sake of healing and the caregiver delivering care. That's uh, pretty straightforward. Washing her husband with dignity. That's a nice one. I like the with dignity part. And it's obvious that they realised that, the, um, that it was a training video and it was health related. And we also needed to know if the people could relate to the characters. And I love this comment from a man in his 70s who said, it's cool to see someone like me. And then when he came up back at follow-up, he told us that watching someone like him in the videos had encouraged him to wash and massage his feet and legs twice a day since the initial training. At the follow-up, we asked them what they liked and didn't like about the videos. Love that one. If I had taken it from my, if I had it from my house, I would have taken it. That means if they had a way to share the digital video, they would have taken it home with them. And this one, that last one from the 20 year old, I'm fond to take care of my mother. It's lovely feedback. This comment from the health extension worker refers to the fact that there'd been a, a ministry of health training in their region um, and they can actually offer support at the health post but many of the people were unaware that this was available to them. And this is a common disconnect that I've frequently observed. Countries do a really good job of getting the training all the way to the health post, but somehow it just doesn't make that last step into the homes of the people, into the hands of the people who actually need to do it every day. Uh, 
We also wanted to know what barriers and challenges people felt would stop them from continuing with the self-care program. And we were a bit surprised when a couple of people told us about pain while they were doing the massage. And while we have a warning at the beginning about never massaging over open skin, we obviously also need to be more explicit about the pressure used as the ones that had pain were doing it way too firmly. So we'll be adding a, a little message about no pain during the massage and as well as no massage during acute attacks. The other big issue though was supplies and in some areas of Ethiopia people can't even afford to buy soap, um, let alone um, massage uh, oils. Since we have a digital tool, we also needed to know about device ownership and usage. And as expected for this region of Ethiopia, device ownership was very low and data was expensive. Only one of the patients had their own phone. But almost half had access to someone else's device. So it was a bit disappointing at follow-up that there hadn't been very many repeat views or shares. And we're looking at ways now that people can donate old phones and tablets perhaps to be refurbished and distributed and, and data sharing plans where you can donate your unused data at the end of the month um, for people uh, in this uh, kind of situation where they don't have their own device and can't afford any data. We've got workshops coming up in Bangladesh where we'll partner with the Centre for Injury Prevention and Research. But before then, we need to create at least one of the exercise videos to take as well. And of course, we have to redress the skeletons with Bangladeshi people, clothing and backgrounds. We also have some additional resources for the community health workers um, who actually will likely all have their own device in Bangladesh. And we're expecting actually that many more of the patients will also have a personal device. So we're going to hopefully have a, a different set of um, feedback when we from those workshops and we'll learn more new things those workshops will be conducted in October. It's very inspiring to attend meetings like the Summer Days and hear all about the new advances, the new ways to measure and treat our lymphedema clients. What I hope is that my presentation has inspired some of you to find ways to extend this collective expertise, your knowledge and your dedication to include some of the 20 million people living with lymphatic filariasis and podoconiosis. They are some of the planet's poorest and most remote communities, and they're struggling to cope without even the basic knowledge that they need to prevent swelling or infection. But we live in a digital age where mobile phones and other digital devices are infiltrating everywhere, even in most of these inaccessible places. And we need to harness this technology and leverage it to fully make sure that knowledge on evidence-based lymphedema management reaches everyone who needs it. The global program has embraced mHealth, and this has been a game changer in at least keeping track of where people are and what services are needed. Although there are still lots of gaps in those services actually being provided as we've seen. And I just wanna to touch on the sustainable development goals here. As if I think people do know about these at all, they often think they're only applicable to developing countries, but they're a blueprint for every country and every individual if we are going to live on a sustainable planet. LKN is doing as much as we can to contribute to goal 3.8, universal health care. And our way of doing that is to see the uh, MMDP pillar of the global programs through to the very end until everyone that requires help with their lymphedema requires the dignity and the ability to live in their community until everyone has the information that they need and no one is left behind. We're establishing a therapist sponsorship program whereby a small portion of the cost of every treatment is donated to LKN. This is a scheme which allows people affected by lymphedema in developed countries to offer hope to their more disadvantaged fellow sufferers through their, their therapists every time they go to the clinic. And if I've inspired you to support our work, please subscribe to our newsletter or YouTube channel or follow us, follow us on your socials and share our posts. And if you can, please consider making a small monthly donation or or a one-off contribution, 
or leave us something in your will. We can wait, we're in it for the long run. And finally, I just want to thank you for your attention today and for allowing me to share a little bit about tropical lymphedema and the LKN Foundation with you. And I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge my mentors, Robert Harris and Hildegard Whitlinger. Your dedication to teaching people all over the world has been an inspiration and set a very high bar for those of us that come after you to live up to. Thank you both.